Ninyad Domostovic says Nadal will catch Federer in the Grand Slams. And he has good reason. Rafa is now closer to catching Federer in the slam count than he's ever been in his career. But I got to tell you, Ninyad, you're not alone. A lot of people think this. But I've heard this before, and it still ain't happened yet. Welcome to the Coffee Break Tennis Podcast. I am your host, Matt Bradshaw. Your co-host, Mr. Goat, the talking tennis cat, is sitting in a chair adjacent. Is that the proper word? Adjacent to mine. It's really quite a sight to behold. Mr. Goat, not the happiest. As you know, Rafa is his least favorite of the big three. He likes Joker slightly better. Of course, he likes uh, Roger, who he's named after, even more. Uh... I am here with Gas Station Coffee, so today is a special edition of Gas Station Coffee Break Tennis, but uh, it's not that bad. Uh, Today's show, we will go through the patron saints of Coffee Break Tennis Patreon's uh, comments, topics, questions, suggestions for the show. It is a special show in that regard, but we did start with Ninyad's comment because what he said is a big point. By the way, towards the end of the show, I dug up some evidence some stats that prove my theory, which some people really didn't like, that uh, Roger Federer did a better job challenging Rafa than Dominic Team did. Sure, he didn't win a set, but we'll show you some sets, um, some, some some stats, and show you why Roger did better, in my opinion. At least he came in with a better game plan and stuck to it better. As you know, the brilliant anal- analysis that I brought <laughs> last video, the Dominic Team tried to out Rafa, Rafa. And it was uh, the wrong plan. But credit Dominic team. He did a great job getting a set. And his win over Djokovic in the semifinal is really a, a big deal. He needs a lot of credit just for that, for repeating his best result ever from last year, making the final again. Uh, anyways, let's start off with the comments. So a lot of people think that Rafa is now going to surpass Federer because he's 18 majors, Federer at 20, Djokovic at 15. But let me remind you, it wasn't that long ago that uh, Djokovic crushed Rafa in the finals of the Aussie Open in January, Januar of uh, Diza Yada. And a lot of people then were saying, oh, now Djokovic is going to pass Rafa. He's going to pass Roger. He's going he's gonna to break everything, all the records. And now, now we're at Rafa's going to do everything. Now a lot of people just expect Rafa to roll into Wimbledon and win that. And my question on the thumbnail of this video is, how much longer will this go on? How many more majors dominated by the big three? Everyone's wondering this. So we go to the Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash coffee break tennis. If you are interested in becoming a part of the team, helping us fight off the ATP sensors and our latest enemy, the Federation du Francois Tennis, whatever they're called. They, uh, they gave us a copy strike. Oh, God, that hurts. They took one of our videos down for using five seconds of Tsitsipas hyperextending his knee. He didn't even hit a ball. It just showed him having a knee injury. And I had to show people that to see how serious it could potentially be. And we got in trouble for that. Well, anyways, if you want to help us fight the ATP censors, if you want to help us fight the good fight against the Federation du Tennis, Francois, Go to patreon.com forward slash coffee break tennis. Become a member of the team. Help the fastest growing tennis talk show in the world. Keep carrying that big momentum. So let's go to the page. Loading comments. Loading comments. We start with John. John has a theory of what's going to play out in the rest of the year, 2019. For the sake of having a good discussion, I would like to pose a statement. Here goes. 2019 will be the last year the big three won a major and one that they are most successful. As in Nole's last AO, Rafa's last Frencho, and Fed's last Wimbo, <laughs> Wimbledon. I just love the poetic way if it were to be true. The next gen are closer. Yeah, kind of. The big three are getting older. We've been hearing that for 10 years now. Well, for Federer at least. The USO will have a first-time major winner. Prove me right or wrong. As long as it is by uh, good argumentation skills with gentleman-like or ladylike tone of voice. Cheers, John. John, the simple response to that is that, think about Roger Federer. No one thought he was going to come back and win more majors, except for me, in 2017. 
I was very confident that he would have a great shot to win the 2017 Wimbledon as soon as I knew he was healthy again and coming back. I think he released a, a video of him training in Dubai and he looked pretty good around like December. And I saw that and I said, Federer's going to win Wimbledon this year because look at what he did on one leg practically. Federer not healthy, the knee was not right, and he almost made the final of Wimbledon in 2016, shuts it down for half a year plus. And I said he's going to win the Wimbledon and he might even have a pretty good Australian Open. And what do you know, he wins it. And he was 35 when he wins Wimbledon, he's less than a month away from turning 36. Djokovic just turned 32. Rafa literally just turned 33 like a week ago. So the simple answer is, why are we going to say these guys are done when they're not even as old as Federer was when he won two majors in the same year? They're still a couple, two, three years away from that. You could make a case that Federer's game is a very special game. He's a very special player. And that even at an older age... He relies so much on the talent and the shot-making skills and the court positioning and all the stuff we talk about that's great about Federer. That is good enough to where he doesn't have to rely on having a young body that can run around for hours and hours and do lots of crazy stuff. Think Dominic Team or Rafa, the way they play. You could make a case and say, Nadal, when he's 36, 37, uh, it's not going to work out the same way for him. But what about Djokovic? Djokovic is like the fittest guy in the history of the sport. There's no way you would expect him to not be playing well two, three years from now. He should be able to win more majors. And how can you say Rafa's not going to win at least another French Open? So that's the simple answer to that, John. Then we go to Pete, who is from Crunch Time Coaching, of course, tennis genius himself, coaching genius. And uh, he's a patron saint. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, all of the patron saints of Coffee Break Tennis. It is a, it's a great thing you're doing. <laughs> we couldn't make the show without you, honestly. If Roger wins Wimbledon and Novak wins the Open, can we just end the debate, call it a three-way tie for the GOAT, greatest of all time? These three are making this debate too confusing and too exhausting. And you got a good point, Pete, because John tacks on to Pete's thought right there, and he says, I agree with this. Everyone can have their own GOAT because it can never be an objective comparison. You got the head-to-head -head debate. You got the weak era factor for Federer, which... I don't believe in, but many people do. You got the Grand Slam count. You got the total titles count. You got the weeks spent at number one ranking in the world. For me, says John, the choice is because of style and natural abilities. Hence, Fed and football, it's Messi. Which uh, I've never heard of Messi. Is Messi uh, a quarterback? A uh, running back? Is he a wide receiver? <laughs> Just kidding. It's football. He's a football player. Soccer, for those of us in the States. Which uh, I know very little about, but I have heard of Messi at least. So it'll forever be a qualitative, subjective thing, or a democ democratically chosen people's champ, which, by the way, if it's that way, the Federer is always going to win the People's uh, Choice Award. Uh, the People's uh, vote will always go for Roger. But John is right. Pete is right. It's confusing and exhausting because of all those things John said. If you just look at the records, you're always going to be able to make a case for somebody because of something amazing that they've done. These big three, it's hard not to say they're... You know, they're the three greatest players of all time. They got the slam records. They got all the records. If you look at the Wikipedia Grand Slam records page, so many funny little records you might not even think of. Uh, so then we go to Cole Deutschendorf, who I'm just tickled that uh, I have a, a patron saint with a great Deutscher name like that. He says, what do you think the GOAT standing would be if Federer is passed in titles won by either Joker and or Nadal? It could happen. I always think the ultimate irony, the most hilarious thing, the last laugh on us, the fans, we get laughed at. And the big three laugh all the way to the bank. If they end tied, if they all have the same slam count, it will be so hilarious. Like I said, they'll be laughing all the way to the bank and we'll be laughed at with all of our big ideas and thoughts on who the GOAT is. And real quick, another thing you have to point out, not just these guys winning all the majors, but how about how they have completely, uh, what's the best word? I don't want to say they've destroyed the careers of everyone else younger than them. But basically, everyone in their 20s, even guys who are now getting into their early 30s, think of the effect mentally the domination from the big three has had on these guys. They've made it very difficult for them to believe. And that's why we got to credit Dominic Team for coming through Djokovic and giving it his all, his all against Rafa. Even if I don't think he followed the best tactics in that match, I think he should have tried some different stuff and would have had more success. 
uh, you got to credit him because at least he has the belief. There's plenty of guys who've just completely lost belief that they can coexist with this big three. So Cole Deutschendorf's comment, what's going to be the new standing? What's going to decide it? I think it'll never end. Like Peter said, it's going to be confusing and exhausting forever, especially if they all finish tied. If they all have 20 majors or 21, of course, as the Fed head, I would love for Federer to finish one or two ahead of those guys. But you can't count them out. These guys have proven they are very special, just like uh, Roger Federer is. And I don't see how this would be the last year for them. You're crazy if you bet against these guys. They've got at least a couple more years of domination in them. Even Federer, he's going to have a great chance at Wimbledon this year. And my rule is, if you look like you have a great chance this year, you probably are going to have a pretty good chance next year. So you can't count Federer out of Wimbledon at least next year as well. Uh, Richard says, I agree with John. I think the U.S. Open is the weakest slam for the big three, and I'm predicting a Tsitsipas breakthrough or a Vavrinka repeat. I could see that. That's a good point. That's the one they've all three won the least, but hard to say it's a weak slam for Federer. Maybe it's a weak slam since 09 when Federer has made, he won five in a row. (laughs) That's not weak. He made six finals in a row, but true. It does not look like a place that is the best matchup for Federer's game as he's gotten older and as the court's been slower and bouncing higher. But I still think Rafa and Joker are going to have a great chance. But I do like Sitsipas and Vavrinka at the U.S. Open. I think that's a good point. Uh, Stefan Sutton says, Yeah, mate, Steph will have his breakthrough by earning a first Grand Slam, which may even be the U.S. Open this year or some other within 2020. I think Steph could do really well at Wimbledon, too. Don't get me wrong. We will have a show tomorrow night, and we'll talk about, first off, we got Dustin Brown <laughs> against uh, Sasha Zverev tomorrow. we got to talk about that. And we're going to see Sitsipas tomorrow in Chautagenbosch in uh, Nederland. So uh, we'll definitely talk about that stuff tomorrow night. Um, anyways, he says, I really think he is the upcoming big deal in tennis right now, although the guys like Sasha and Gata Kachimal, Kachinov, Pokemaster, for example, will also soon be able to interfere more intensively. These guys just have to take an example on Sitsipas and increase their concentration and coolness in order to withstand the crucial encounters that follow. And I think that's kind of funny because I'm imagining this little knob you crank up and you say, increase concentration, increase coolness. It's not that easy. If it was, everyone would do it. It all comes down to the mental game and the belief. And right now, even over Zverev, Zverev has shown that he can, but not enough. I believe more in Sitsipas than any of these guys because Sitsipas believes more than any of these guys, including the guys who are much older than him, that he can coexist with the big three. You know, you're underwater, and the big three are these giant sharks, and they rule the sea. And uh, somebody's got to be a big whale. Who's a beluga whale? Because I love whales. You know why I love whales? Because they make that sweet sound. Sounds more like Chewbacca than a whale. But you get my point. Dominic Team, he's like a really solid sea turtle right now. Can't bite through him. He's got like a steel shell, and he's working on his chompers. He's a snapping turtle, and and he, and he believes that he belongs to those big sharks. Maybe he'll grow into a shark. Maybe he's an orca. Maybe he's a killer whale. Comment below what animal under the sea Stephanos Sissipas is. Uh, what else do we got here? Simu. What about Nick Kyrgios? What do you think? What version of Kyrgios will we see at Wimbledon? Stefan <laughs> did it best. There we have the first result. A clear 6-3, 6-4 loss against Berrettini. What a start. Hey, Matteo, Matteo Berrettini looks pretty good. And who does he play tomorrow? Because uh, I believe we have a very interesting matchup with Berrettini tomorrow. That is a must-see tennis TV. Anyways, I've been pretty impressed by him just to see him come through. But again, Kyrgios, man, the way he drops the ball, he's like the opposite of Rafa, which is part of why Rafa can't stand playing him. I think we'll get the usual with Kyrgios. He'll go to Wimbledon. If he has a big matchup against somebody, he'll step up his game like he always does if he has a chance to take on a big three guy. Uh, Part of me feels like he wants to lose his seating. He wants to do bad so he's not seated and he can meet somebody early. And, you know, he does amazing stuff. But he doesn't do the basics well enough, and he he sure can. He needs to return better, too, at Wimbledon. His serve is one of the very best. He sure can do it, but will he? Let me sip some of this gas station coffee, by the way. 
All right, uh, we're about to get to the part of the show where I give you the proof that Roger did a better job, in my opinion. I thought there was one more good comment here. Uh, I can't find it. Let's go. Cover all that stuff. Do you guys see where I'm going with all this? The big three are not done. It will keep going. The conversation, as Peter Freeman, tennis genius, says, is confusing and exhausting. But you know what? Would you rather it be something else? Let's say, uh, not to pick on Miloš, but would you rather it be the Miloš Raonic show? Raonic and Zverev clashing at the majors. Would that be more fun? No way. The big three. God bless them. And uh, all hail the three kings. The three kings of tennis. I hope they continue for uh, very long. Gene Kern, who we love here, is a patron saint. And she says, I'd like a comparison of clay versus grass and the style play differences required to score on each. And also, please, a little more praise for Dominic Team for actually taking a set off of Rafa. So, um, I sense that Gene was a little disappointed in the way I said Dominic Team cannot be happy and is really not much closer. It is a tremendous accomplishment to come through Djokovic in that crazy match. And oh, real quick, Dominic Team in a press conference before the final said, I'll be fine. You know, uh, I'm not tired. They said, no, aren't you going to be tired after uh, this crazy schedule? But one thing he said is very true. It's more exhausting to play matches that start and stop because of the, the the rain and whatever. The wind, whatever, stopped it. And that's very true. That's mentally exhausting. And to do it against Djokovic, that was an amazing co- accomplishment from Dominic Team, Getting back to the final, winning a set. But, as you will see in just a moment, let's do the clay versus grass stuff really quick. The clay versus grass is pretty simple. You got to serve great because if you serve great, it's going to be really hard to break you and you're going to have a chance to win no matter what happens in the match. So serving is becomes more important than it is on clay. You can serve great, but somebody like a Rafa or a Dominic team can uh, neutralize your great serving pretty easily, even if you're a great server like Roger Federer. And also, your return, you really got to be good about shortening up your backswing even more so and taking the ball earlier. You can't really back up super far on grass like you can on the clay. It's not going to be nearly as effective. Coming to net on grass is going to be a much bigger reward. You know, originally these guys like Rod Laver, they all came to the net right away. And part of that was just the bounce was not as good. The grass is much nicer the way they they maintain it better. They build it up better, I guess. Used to get bad bounces, funny bounces, short, sideways, lower, whatever. And you just didn't want to deal with bounces very much. So you got to the net as soon as possible. Plus, it's much easier to finish a point at the net, really anywhere, but especially on grass. I talked about how on clay, you slip and slide and lose your footing and changing direction can be tricky. So a well-placed volley can finish you. That same deal with grass, a little slippy and slidey. And uh, the ball stays much lower, so you get less time to run over and get that short volley. Think of Federer doing his drop shots on the return, doing his angle short ball to pull you into the net to a very low ball. Much easier for Roger Federer to hurt you with those kind of shots. Uh, A very biting, good slice. Ash Barty, very impressive at the French Open. No reason to think she can't win Wimbledon with that slice. She's got the best slice on the women's tour. Uh, Federer's got the best slice on the men's tour. Dominic Team's slice is better. Maybe that'll help him uh, break through at Wimbledon. Uh, Djokovic and Rafa have built up a great slice over the years to help them win Wimbledon where it wasn't their very best surface early on in their careers. And so those are the main differences in grass. And I have only played on grass one time. I slipped and fell pretty early. I only got a chance to play for like 20 minutes, and I ate it up bad because it was just uh, awkward moving on it for me. One thing I always hear, I can't attest to this because I haven't played on grass enough to know, but you always hear that you start feeling um, different muscles in your body get sore that you don't use as much on the other surfaces because you spend so much time getting down low for the ball more than you would anywhere else. That's the big difference on grass. And that's why Roger Federer does great there because it rewards great serving. It rewards a great slice backhand and it rewards drop shots, short balls, and uh, great net play more than anywhere else. And it's fast. We all know Roger likes a fast court, which is uh, a big reason why I think the way he played at the French, the way Ash Barty played at the French, no reason to think that those two can't win at Wimbledon. So let's do my thing with team really quick and we'll get out of here. So, I said, sure, Dominic Team won a set, but I felt like Federer had better tactics and stuck to the baseline better, did more things that could potentially hurt Rafa. I felt like the wind really made it hard on Federer to time the Rafa ball from that close on the baseline 
and credit Roger for sticking to the plan despite the conditions, makes it harder to handle that ball and put it, because that's the thing, Roger, not only does he have to stand on the baseline, Federer standing on the baseline, hitting the ball his pace, is almost the same ball to Rafa as Dominic Team standing back and crushing it much harder than Federer's hitting it. That's why Federer not only had to stand on the baseline and be a baseline hawk, but he had to hit some very tough spots, some smaller targets around the court, like corners, lines, angles, short angles. And it was just harder to do. Same with his serve. But despite that, I felt, I really felt, Federer did a better job challenging Rafa in many ways. And I dug through the stats, and here we go. Here's my proof. First serve points one. Here is Federer. 61%. Rafa wins 68%. Rafa holds, Roger holds Rafa, so Roger did a good job returning first serve points because he holds him below 70. Dominic Team, Nadal wins 73. Dominic Team wins 57. So uh, do the math on that. I'll put these on the screen, by the way. So on first serve, not only does Roger on first serve win more points than Dominic Team, he holds Nadal back more and doesn't allow Nadal to win as many points as Dominic Team did. Now, second serve. Federer did a better job returning because Rafa wins 64% against uh, Dominic Team and only 56 That's an 8% swing against Roger. But Roger does not do as well in the second serve as Dominic Team. He has a 39%, whereas Dominic Team won 50 But look, Dominic Team served 28 second serve points. Second serve is never as important a factor as first serve because there's just less points. That's 50% of 28, and then he wins 57% of 64 So about double twice as many first serve points for Dominic Team that he plays on his serve compared to second serve. So, sure, Dominic Team better there, but you'd rather have the first serve win there. Uh, break points won. Federer converts two out of four. Dominic Team two out of six, and an extra set. So, Roger did better at converting his chances and got just as many chances if you don't count that set, I guess more. Uh, he holds, he forces Rafa to work harder. Six out of 16, that's 37%. Dominic Team seven out of 13, that's over 50%. Um, you know, if you win the match, if you get enough breaks, who cares how many chances you missed out? So that one doesn't matter as much to me, but just another point to show Federer did a better job in some ways to challenge Rafa, make life hard on him. Of course, the return points, so important on clay. And Roger wins 34% on return. Dominic Team 29%. I'm sorry, but if you're under 30 on win on return, it's pretty much impossible for you to win a match in the ATP, unless you do it all in tiebreakers, if you're Ivo Karlovic or John Isner. Uh, total points won. This is a big one for me, because, sure, you won a set, but Roger won more points. 43% of the points were won were by Roger against Rafa, 41%. I know it's not a big difference, but I'm telling you, I think Roger came in with the smarter tactics without the windy conditions, he does a better job for sure. I think Dominic Team tried to play too much like Rafa. He hit everything to the Rafa backhand, and I'm sorry, but if you keep putting the ball in the same spot, it works when Rafa does it because it's high to a backhand, and that's trickier, especially for Dominic Team and Roger who have one-handers. But for Rafa, he loves that inside-out forehand. His backhand has gotten so good over the years. If you make Rafa hit his weaker shot on the run, that's what Roger was always doing. Go hard at the back forehand of Rafa to move him out of the court and open it up a bit and then attack the backhand or go to net and make Rafa hit a backhand pass on the run, make Rafa just hit a backhand on the run. Dominic Team, on the other hand, crushing the ball, a ball that he's far back enough that Rafa's going to be able to get back the majority of the time, and he's hitting the backhand, and if you give Rafa all these chances, keep putting the ball in the same spot, Rafa is eventually going to be right on top of the baseline, and he's going to rip that cross-court backhand, which opens things up so well for him because the next ball usually comes short and then he's got an inside out forehand or or he'll even if he's feeling good he'll pull that backhand up the line for a clean winner rafa hit some tremendous backhands uh hit the music we're getting out of here thank you for listening to the podcast today we will be back late tomorrow night to talk about grass it's it, it's grass court season it's a wonderful time it's like having a big christmas tree spread out all over the tennis court and when roger federer makes the final of Wimbledon there is nothing more exciting for a tennis fan and oh I hope real quick the rankings have changed Roger it looks kind of far from Rafa but don't forget grass courts Wimbledon they seed you according to grass court results they seed that they um weigh that heavier if Roger can win in Halle Halle he will be number two seed
which means he wouldn't face Djokovic until the final. And we could see another Fadal semifinal, or maybe, magically, we somehow see the Fadal final if Rafa gets in the Joker half, which, fingers crossed, what magic it would be to see a rematch of the 2008 Wimbledon final with Roger and Rafa. Nothing more exciting than that for a tennis fan. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Make sure uh, you check out the patreon.com forward slash coffee break tennis page. If you want to join the team, we would appreciate it very, 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 very much. See ya.